Hey everyone, when I teach Math 3070, I'm teaching a class that uh, assumes that the students know, uh, at the very least, Calculus 2, which covers at the University of Utah and also at the community college where I went, um, which uh, at some level is mimicking the University of Utah, at least in their math courses. It, it, it covers integral calculus and it covers things such as integration by parts and uh, change of variables and stuff like that. M the most important of which of those uh, Calc 2 skills being integration by parts, uh, it covers those things, but it does not generally cover uh, multivariate calculus. I cannot imagine that being covered. That is a Calculus 3 topic. And unfortunately, we're moving into a part of probability theory where we're talking about the uh, behavior of random variables that have some joint distribution, and we're talking about continuous random variables, which means that we're going to need multivariate calculus, since in order to be able to understand that, you need to be able to talk about a multivariate density, density function, and talking about integrals when there are multiple variables. So I wanted to give a basic introduction to multivariate calculus to be able to get through those chapters and be able to compute the integrals that I want students to be able to compute. This is not a replacement for multivariate calculus and this is not intended to be a replacement for those. Um, if you want to learn more you can take a proper multivariate calculus course like uh, Calculus 3 at the University of Utah um, and you can also look maybe in some books. I personally uh, the book that I used for for calculus was fine, but that doesn't mean that I want to go recommending it uh, because while it was fine in that it got the job done, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best book. At some level, any calculus book is going to have a discussion on multivariate calculus and that discussion will be fine, All right? Because calculus is a very old subject. Um, it, calculus is basically settled mathematics. And so any, 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 any book should be able to talk about calculus and multivariate calculus and multivariate integrals and have a, and have a reasonable discussion. Uh, now, all, there is the book that's used at the University of Utah, and I don't like it. I hate that book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be straight. I'm going to be straight. I do not like that book personally. So, uh, like, I, I haven't actually, I didn't actually use that book myself when I took Calculus 3, but I've tutored and I've worked with other students using that book, and I just, I just hate it. I do not like that book. So, um, I don't, I definitely don't want to recommend that book. So, here's a book that supposedly is. I, I think this book is more oriented towards uh, prospective mathematicians as opposed to, say, the engineers who just want to know how to do the calculations and be able to go on with their lives. Uh, so this may be somewhat of a more advanced book, but this is a book that people on the Internet supposedly like. So uh, there's something for you to look at. Anyway, let's move on. First, by discussing... By discussing... Discussing... <laughs> Uh, discussing multivariate functions. So, multivariate functions. We are leaving the realm of univariate functions and talking about multivariate functions. Before, functions were generally of this form. They take a real number as an input. This is the domain of the function, and they return a real number as the output. That's the range of the function. And that was fine, although you probably were thinking, well, that's just kind of silly to just say it takes a real number as an input and returns a real number as an output. Don't functions do that? Well, okay. When we're moving into multivariate calculus, it's not as obvious that that's what's going on. Uh, we could instead be talking about functions that take instead a tuple, uh, a d-dimensional tuple, and return a real number as an output. Now, technically, these should be considered vectors, and we talk about rd as a vector space but i don't really want to talk about the geometry of rd or r2 i'm willing to leave that vector structure alone for now and just leave that for the actual probability course 
That said, of course, uh, vectors being are, are a very important object in mathematics. They're a very important object in calculus. They're a very important object in probability. And they're a very important object in statistics. And when I think about classes that students should have a very solid foundation of when going into, well, really any mathematics, but if they're planning on doing some sort of graduate level course in which they're going to be doing any mathematics, there's two classes that come to mind to me that you should have a very solid foundation of because they are just so integral to the rest of mathematics, including statistics. Those classes are calculus and linear algebra. Calculus and linear algebra, but almost if I if you if you point it, if held a gun to my head and asked pick one calculus or linear algebra, I'd probably say linear algebra. That's showing up everywhere. Almost everything is using those those concepts at a very deep level. So I would strongly suggest getting extremely comfortable and mastering calculus and linear algebra. Um, okay, so, and, and I just mentioned that because I was talking about vectors, and that's essentially a linear algebra I idea. Uh, so these, number, these functions take real numbers as inputs and return real numbers as outputs. Uh, you could potentially talk about numbers that return tuples as outputs as well, but eh, that's not particularly interesting right now. So we're going to start by studying functions that are uh, that ha that are basically defined on the plane, the Cartesian plane that has an x co coordinate and a y coordinate. We call this R two because it's a combination of a real number that c corresponds to the x dimension and a real number that corresponds to the y dimension. So we call it R two uh, because there are two tuples. Uh, uh, so a tuple with two numbers in it. So one such function that is a function from R2 to R is the function fxy, which is equal to x plus y. This is a linear function. Uh, here is a visualization of what this function looks like. Um, so, all right, you're probably familiar with linear functions in one dimension. A linear function in one dimension looks like this. It's a line. All right, so nothing too exciting about this, although linear functions... In mathematics are extremely important and mathematicians spend a long time thinking about linear stuff uh, so this function right here x plus y is a linear function in three-dimensional space what this function produces is a surface right when we look at this picture what we see is a surface numbers from the x and y coordinates get mapped to a z coordinate and what essentially gets happened is uh, what what essentially gets happened what the heck is up with my language so what happens is when we create a function like this we end up mapping the two-dimensional plane and transforming it into a surface in this case the surface is basically a tilted cartesian plane uh, it, it, it has uh, some incline to it and you can imagine that this plane is extending out in uh, in, in uh, all directions, uh, like so. So, but but this is the result, and uh, we're often working with these surfaces. All right. So, um, all right. So this is uh, the multivariate equivalent of a linear function. You remember those linear functions from. The univariate case, which where you have f of x is equal to a plus bx, that's a linear function. And this is an equivalent of a linear function. So let's examine the idea of this being a linear function for a second. How is that how is it why is it reasonable to say that a function of this form is linear? Um, well, what we could do is uh, consider slices. We could consider a function g. And this function is a function that takes a real number as an input and returns a real number as an output. G of t has basically, um, what it does is it takes your, your function f and then plugs in two functions, x of t and y of t, that as you plug in t will give you a different coordinate along the plane. So here basically would be the plane. Here we have an x x-axis and a y-axis. And t, we kind of think of t as time, and we think of it as defining some path 
along uh, the Cartesian plane. So as we're moving along the path, we are increasing t. All right, so we're, we're, we're defining some path along the plane, and as we move along the path, we are tracking the value of our function f. Okay, and let's consider paths of the form x of t equals a plus bt and y of t equals c plus dt. These are paths that are essentially linear paths. So if you were to visualize such a path, uh, probably the simplest such path uh, is x of t equals t and y of t equals a plus bt. But in any case, a path of such a form will look something like this. So it's just going to be possibly an angled uh, an angled line along the xy plane, but we're also allowed to think of paths that are just going to be parallel to either the x-axis or the y-axis. So paths of this form are also not only allowed, but in fact probably of uh, greater interest than general angled paths. Um, but I'm pretty much allowing for any path in this uh, in this uh, framework. In fact, later on, I'll consider paths of the form t and t squared, where such a path is li like a, um, a parabola of sorts. So we are traveling along the xy plane along a parabola, and as we travel, we're also tracking the value of the surface above us and the height of that surface. So... If we are considering a linear path and our function f is a linear function, then the path g, uh, or, or, or the function g, which is the uh, value of f as we move along the path, is going to be a linear function. So one way to understand this function f, because we have this three-dimensional object, and the thing about three-dimensional objects is that they're kind of hard to plot by hand, uh, one way you could possibly understand it is by plotting its value along interesting paths. So uh, so in interesting paths could include paths where we fix either x or y. That would correspond to uh, maybe g of t, uh, we'll call this gx of t, is equal to f, uh, x, and t. And this would be a path where x is treated as fixed or constant. Um and t is what's varying. So in that case, we have effectively, when we're moving along this path, we have fixed an x value, and we're just moving up and down parallel to the y-axis. Okay, this would be one interesting path, and if we were to sketch, um, so maybe if we were to go back to this illustration, this path uh, it is going to be parallel to either the x or y-axis, and our function g, oops, what did I do? Uh, go back here. Our function g is going to be tracking what our function above us, uh, f, is uh, looking like. So we would have uh, such a function. So let's consider uh, what this function g, which corresponds to f along a slice, uh, what this actually looks like. So uh, g of t is equal to uh, f uh, x t and that's going to be x plus t so if we were to plot this this uh this function along the slice uh, that would be we have uh, we're going to have the t and uh, g of t axes and uh, the x-intercept is going or the y-intercept is going to be at x so this is x, and otherwise it's just a straight line. And as we would change the slice, we would imagine this line moving either up or down because our x value is either moving up or down. So um, another way you could potentially view this slice is what we've done is intersected uh, our... We, we've intersected our function with... Um, with another plane and we have tracked what this function looks like along that uh, along that intersection maybe that's another way to think about what we're doing when we're slicing and we sliced in this case in the uh 
in the x direction where we fixed x and we allowed y to vary but we could also work with other slices uh, such as a slice where uh, we fix y and allow x to vary and then as we do that we're tracking uh, what this function would look like along such a slice okay and actually that such a path would if, if we were to look at gy of t which is a which is um the value of f as we move as we allow x to vary but fix a y that's going to be of the form uh y plus t oops that would be of the form y plus t which actually is an identical picture because this function is uh, very symmetrical. That's one unfortunate thing about the, these notes. All of the functions here that I worked with are extremely symmetrical with each other. So in, in that um, the X and Y parameters are almost always interchangeable. Uh, that's, that's an unfortunate thing, but at the same time, I don't think that should be too much of a problem. Um, I think the techniques that I show here, I don't think that students will have too much it's not that much of a mental leap to imagine, okay, maybe maybe the parameters that we're working with are not completely uh, symmetrical always. All right, so um, example one, prove that any function of the form f of xy is equal to ax plus by plus c is linear quotient to the, is linear quotient, I can't talk, is linear according to the notion of linearity used above, where what I say is that a linear function will... Uh, look linear according to any linear slice. And I say linear slices because we could have a nonlinear slice where uh, maybe we're moving along this uh, uh, parabolic path and the resulting uh, function tracking the the uh, height of the surface above, this uh, G function, it won't look linear. But let's show that if our... So let's show that um, linear functions... Uh, well, any function of this form is going to be linear since whenever we plug in a linear path or we'll look at this function along a linear path, it's always going to be linear. So a linear fa a linear path is a path of where our x co our x coordinate is of the form a plus b x uh, a plus b t sorry, and our y coordinate is of the form c plus d t. Actually, this this notation is rather unfortunate. We should not use a and b. And C and D like this because we have capital A B C. So um, let's use instead um, what's something that we could use instead. Uh, let's see, we could go uh, P Q R S. There we go. So we'll say P plus Q T and then R plus S T. All right, and we're tracking the function along such a linear path. And this function, if we plug in these uh, uh, these uh, coordinates into this, that's going to be, we've got a p plus q t uh, plus b r plus s t uh, plus C and then what are we going to do next well we're going to uh, uh, we're, we're going to multiply all those uh, constants so we have a p plus a q t plus b r plus b s t plus c and then we collect terms uh, that don't or that are not being multiplied by t and what are being multiplied by t and we're going to end up with uh, a p plus b r uh, uh, plus c as our constant coefficient let's move this uh, so they have more room so we're going to have uh, a p plus b r plus c as our uh, intercept term and then plus a q plus b s uh, t so we have something of the form um, uh, intercept and uh, slope 
So if we were to plot what this looks like, we would have basically the intercept and the slope slope like so because we're just multiplying with t here so we have t and g of t so this is in fact a linear function and and hence uh the function f whenever we plug it whenever we look at f along a linear path it always looks like a linear function so this will be a linear so this will be a linear function uh next example y is the function f of x y which is equal to let's uh clear things up x times y why is that not linear after all if x is treated as fixed then if we look at this uh, function uh, along a slice where we fix x then we end up with the function xt and that's linear because what that looks like is we have a slope of x um, but it's, its intercept is zero and the same could be said if we fixed y so if we looked at it along a slice along y it would it would look linear again so why is this function not even look linear in a three-dimensional plot? If we look at a plot of this function, this is what we see. And that actually does look pretty different from the linear plots that we were looking at before. A linear function in this uh, space will always look like a tilted Cartesian plane where all you did was tilt it, you didn't deform it in any way. But this, this, uh, this Cartesian plane instead looks deformed. So why is this, why is this the case? Uh, why is this thing not linear? Well, if we were to look at this function, um, if we say that x of t is equal to t and y of t is also equal to t, so this would be corresponding to a linear path where we are just uh, traveling along the line x equals y. Okay, so that's basically the line across which we are slicing this function. If we then look at the value of this function along this slice, so f of t, t, what we get is, all right, we do x times y, which is t times c, which is t squared. And t squared is quadratic. So this is quadratic, it's not linear. So we found a linear path along which the resulting function, if we if we're tracking its, uh, if, if we're tracking the 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 value of the surface above us, the that surface doesn't look linear. So hence the resulting function is not a linear function. Okay, so uh, these these plots that that we've been looking at, like this plot. Oh, by the way, uh, that path basically corresponds to. Uh, we're traveling this way, and we look at the function above us, and the resulting function has, well, basically has a quadratic shape. So um, it doesn't look linear uh, along that slice. Okay? All right. So plots like these, by the way, I mean, they're nice. But at the same time, though, they're really hard to make by hand. Uh, there's another way to potentially visualize these surfaces, and it's not just a visualization technique. It's useful to think about these surfaces this way, too. Uh, we can use what's known as a level plot. A level plot is basically a plot where you imagine yourself staring down. Um, you, you imagine yourself staring down. Here's your eye down onto the Cartesian plane and tr and and what you see is basically uh, a shading where uh, of the surface where parts that are close to closer to you are lighter or they at least appear closer to you and parts that are farther away look farther away uh, you've probably seen maps where a map is a 2d surface but it's trying to it's trying to visualize a 3d object like some like like a, a a topography so when you look at a map you often see shapes like this where um it, where uh, there's actually a hill here and there will be like lines along the hill that's saying like this corresponds to 1000 meters high this is 2000 meters this is 3000 meters so our, this is a probably a very steep uh, mountain where it's uh, growing by kilometers something like that you could eh, I probably should say a hundred meters because I think such a such a creep such a 
land mass is a little a little extreme there aren't very many land masses like that but anyway you've probably seen maps like that where uh you're seeing lines that are just saying this is the re this is the line along which this uh, object uh, in which case it's like a hill uh, has a common height and uh, we can construct such maps for functions too so we might uh, for instance have um, a map where we, we have something looking like this and and maybe we have a note saying this is c equals one c equals two or where this is like uh, the z dimensions equal to one or the z dimensions equal to two uh, where we this would course this would then translate into an object that is uh that has circular cross sections and is increasing so we're we're looking at the cross sections of these uh objects and uh trying to use those cross sections to understand the object's topography so to create a level plot the idea is we take our function and we set it to some number c and then we after we fix that constant, we're going to look at the relationship that emerges along among the X and Y coordinates. So let's, for example, uh, see what level curves would look like for our linear function f of x, y uh, equals x plus y. To determine what a level curve would look like, we would say c equals x plus y. All right, that's fine, but... What we're going to do is we're in the end we are going to plot the level curves on a cartesian plane where we're looking down on the plane we have the x coordinate and the y coordinate and we're going to see what the relationship between x and y looks like after we have fixed a number c so i should probably get this in terms of y alone and what we'll end up saying is that y is equal to c minus x okay and then we're going to vary c consider potential c like, for example, we could consider uh, c equals 1 or c equals 0 and so on, and then plot the resulting line. All right, so if c equals 0, then we will have... Hmm, I wonder if there's a nice way... Oh, uh, we're, we're, we can't quite get a nice range of colors, unfortunately. Um, but maybe we could do something like this. Uh, we will start with what should be our middle color. Uh, let's say green. So if C is equal to zero, then we have the line Y equals negative X, which is going to just uh, pass through the origin and look like so. So this will be the line uh, C equals zero. So this is what the this is what our linear plane looks like uh, when we intersect it uh, with what what we're doing in a sense visually when we are creating these level plots is we are taking uh, we before we were considering intersections with planes that were perpendicular to the cartesian plane uh, but we can instead uh, look at planes uh, look at intersections with planes that are horizontal to or parallel to the cartesian plane below so in a sense what we were doing is uh constructing a plane at some height and intersecting uh and uh, intersecting our surface with that plane and seeing what that intersection looks like okay so uh if we so here is the intersection with the plane that is completely level with the with the cartesian plane uh, let's uh, let's um, let's do yellow. Uh, no, let's see. Uh, yeah, does it not want to click yellow? Huh? It will not click yellow. All right, fine. Be uncooperative. All right. Uh, maybe we could t uh, instead try c equals negative one, so it will it'll intercept at the at negative one, but otherwise at the same slope. Uh, so this would be. Uh, C equals negative one. Uh, we could get even darker, and this will be uh, C equals negative two. And then we could maybe get a little lighter and say, all right, let's try C equals one. 
so this is c equals 1 and uh, maybe then go to c equals 2 all right and uh, as we track these values of c we can see that um, essentially we are increasing as we move in the x and y direction together but this is giving us a sense of what this uh, object looks like and we can see by the fact that uh, we are increasing our c's that there is a that there is a slant in the in the op in, in this uh, in this uh, surface and this surface otherwise is essentially pretty flat because there's no curves in any of these lines right so this is the resulting level plot all right so and uh, this is a linear function so the resulting level curves are also linear of course we don't have to have uh, we, we don't really have to have the, we could have linear level curves and at, yet at the same time a nonlinear function because you can imagine that, well, what if we remove the signs from these? <laughs> Excuse me. What if we remove the signs from these? Well, then the resulting object would actually look a little bit more um, like uh, if we were to plot this in three dimensions instead of incl inclining like this, it would have some sort of a bounce, right? So we would have some uh, bouncing object, uh, uh, some bouncing surface, right? That that would be what we would get if we had, uh, if we didn't have those signs. But we do in fact have the signs, so the result is a linear surface. Okay. Um, let's uh, consider some more uh, level curves. So here is the function fxy equals x squared plus y squared, which is visualized in this figure. Um, we are going to take a plane to, to construct a level curve and uh, intersect uh, the, uh, the function with that plane. And what results is a circle because we, t we say, okay, fxy... Uh, which is equal to x squared plus y squared. This is equal to c. All right. And this is the formula. You may have seen this before in like uh, intermediate uh, intermediate algebra or college algebra, uh, that this is an expression that defines a circle. So this is a circle. Uh, I mean, this is the conics stuff. So this is a circle with a radius... Uh, square root of c okay so if we were to draw the level curves for this surface we would perhaps uh, start um, with well okay we've got it we've got the case where c equals zero in which case there's only one there's only one possibility for c equals zero and that's basically the point uh, x equals zero and y equals zero so this is c equals zero uh, and then we would move on to, let's say, uh, c equals 1, and the result would be a circle of radius 1. So this would be c equals 1. And then we would move to c equals 2. Well, no, let's not move to c equals 2. Let's instead move to c equals 4. So the, surf, so the circle we get is here when c equals 4, because the radius will be 2. So this is c equals 4. And then we could move on to say uh, c equals uh, c equals nine, in which case we have a circle of radius three. So this will be c equals nine. Okay. All right. And those would be the level curves. And notice that in this case the c's are increasing quite rapidly as we move out in radius. Uh, because, well, that's kind of what this uh, shape looks like. It's kind of this this uh, steep cup. Uh, I think the term for this is paraboloid. I think that's what they call it. Uh, but it's a steep cup um, that uh, we're, we're uh, looking at. Okay. So it, this, these level curves are basically what we see when we slice horizontally by another plane and what we're looking at as we look down on the object. Uh, and uh, all right, so let's uh, see another level curve for another function, which is the function fxy, which is equal to xy. 
So we say x y is equal to uh, is equal to a number c, which means if we're going to try to plot a level curve, we're going to say y is equal to c over x. All right. So if we were to plot the level curve for this, uh, we could try c equals one, in which case what we'll get is uh, if we say c equals one. All right. We do have zero. So what? So if we say uh, c equals zero. That actually corresponds to either x or y being zero. So we could either have uh, x or y be zero. So the level curve is actually not quite a function. It's this uh, cross. So this cross corresponds to c equals zero. If we were to move to, let's say, c equals one, then we would have the function y equals one over x, which looks like this. So this would be c equals 1. And then if we were to move to c equals 2, uh, this would be, um, we would just have a more inclined, uh, a, a more inclined function, but it's still the function 2 over x. So this is c equals 2. Okay, uh, what if we tried c equals uh, negative 1? So if we had c equals negative 1, in this case we'd have the function negative 1 over x, which looks like this. So this would be c equals negative 1. So c equals negative 1. Let's also write uh, c equals 2 over here. And then if we were to uh move to negative two we would get uh just something that's even more negative so we get c equals negative two this is the resulting level curve for that okay and this is the resulting surface so it, it produces that saddle looking shape because uh, what this sketch is telling us is that at in the direction x equals y we have this increasing surface so we could maybe uh so in the direction x equals y uh we have a an increasing surface that's looking somewhat quadratic so we have something that looks like this but in the direction x equals negative y and that's unfortunately not that all that easy to draw we have a de decreasing surface so a decrease so a parabola pointing down so yeah, it's a little unfortunate how exactly I uh, I uh, drew attempted to draw the three axes, but whatever. Okay, all right. So that was a discussion in two dimensions, and the thing is, the two dimensional case. We're often talking about the two dimensional case only because it's convenient, and admittedly, a lot of this stuff like calculus was intended to develop physics, and physics works in three spatial dimensions, like. Uh, Newton and Leibniz were the ones who were uh, inventing calculus essentially simultaneously. Newton was a, uh, inventing calculus to be able to explain physics concepts and explore uh, Newtonian physics. And Newtonian physics is essentially something that lives in three sp spatial dimensions, so uh, that means that we're working in three spatial dimensions. But the, the thing, though, is mathematically there's nothing special about the number two. Like, there's nothing particularly special about uh, the two in R two. We can function. Uh, we can consider, for example, uh, a three dimensional function like so. And mathematically, it's fine. Like mathematically, we're handling this thing exactly the way, the same way uh, we would anything else. The unfortunate thing, though, is that when considering such functions, it's really hard to visualize them. Like I, I don't really know how to visualize a four dimensional function like this. Like we might attempt maybe uh, level level shapes um, or what would you call uh, a three dimensional object? I don't know three uh, level objects at, in a sense uh, to try to understand a three dimensional shape. Uh, in which case, maybe this thing is uh, producing for our equivalent of level curves, uh, level surfaces. But the thing though is, it's just not all that enlightening to consider stuff like that. Uh, so it's just hard to visualize when we're moving into higher dimensions. And in this case, the, here we're, we're working essentially with a function that is 
uh, so a function f that is from r3 to r. This is the function that we're working with. We could consider we can still define paths. Like we can still talk about functions g of t, which is f uh, x t uh, y t uh, z t. Maybe this would be one way to potentially understand this because this would be a path in like three dimensions right and uh, this is a path moving through three-dimensional space and as we move through three-dimensional space we're tracking the value of our function uh, oops that's that's not what I wanted um, like we could potentially try that but still though uh oh uh oh uh Okay, now stuff isn't being cooperative. It it doesn't it doesn't want to work with my pen. <laughs> oh, it doesn't want to work with my pen now. That's 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 great. Okay. Um, well, anyway, uh, continuing on, um, the problem is that we can't visualize this, but mathematically there is no issue. There is nothing that that was special in the mathematics about the, about the number two. Um, and similarly, like let's like what about three? Three is not that large of a number. Well, okay. Let's consider another function uh, down here. Number five, f x1 to xd uh, is going to be the sum from i equals one to d. And we have uh, several coefficients multiplied with the variables in our function. Okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this. Oh, this is really not cooperative. Huh. Does this... Oh no. Oh no. Oh no, the uh the app crashed. For some reason the app broke. <laughs> okay. I got to restart this app. But anyway, um there's there's like right here, there's nothing like like this is a perfectly valid function. And it's going from R D to R. In this case, the idea of this function is okay, we have WI, which are coefficients that correspond to the number of shares of a stock that we have. Uh, we're calling it stock I, and XI is the value of a single share of that stock. So the total value of that sh of of our investment in that stock is going to be WI times XI, and then we add up for all the stocks in our portfolio. This is a perfectly value uh, valid function, and especially if we're talking about stocks, there are thousands of stocks on Wall Street. If we're talking about, say, an index fund in the S and P five hundred then we're going to have at least 500 stocks and uh, we could and this isn't even all that large when talking about uh wall street hedge funds so d in this case could be not just like it could be much larger than three it could be a thousand it could be five thousand and it would be perfectly fine and valid as a function so d when we're talking about dimension it's not always going to be spatial dimension like d the word dimension in mathematics goes beyond just spatial dimension. It's just talking about how many variables in some sense we're allowed to change. And that can be very high. And not only are we interested in high dimensional uh, stuff in, uh, in mathematics, but in statistics too, we're often working with high dimensional stuff. Like talking about a stock portfolio in mathematical finance or in statistics that's a perfectly reasonable thing to talk about, in which case the dimension will be extremely large. So we're going to have to consider and get comfortable with uh, working in those higher dimensions. Now, we still kind of visualize stuff in two dimensions because a lot of the visualizations in two dimensions are perfectly reasonable. But I'm going to have to close this app and restart it. Um, it's perfectly reasonable to talk about, uh, to, to visualize our stuff. That said... Um, there are some uh, deeper results. Ooh, this app is not closing. This is this is not good. Um, so while we're uh, uh, certainly, what was I saying? I'm having some technical issues, and they're and they're distracting me. Um, crap! I don't remember what I was saying. Uh. Well, basically, I'm going to present stuff that's supposed to be also for general D dimensions. Like, for example, I'm going to talk about partial derivatives, and, I, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what they're like in general D dimensions. And 
I'll still visualize stuff in two dimensions. Um, there are some things that don't quite translate. Like there's some uh, facts about high dimensional spa uh, space. Like maybe you've heard of the curse of dimensionality that talks about how geometry does change as we go into higher and higher dimensions and how in some sense, as we increase dimensions, we're pushing points in space farther apart. Uh, that's the curse of dimensionality. Oh, this app is not closing. I'm going to have to kill it. Um, so things are not always the same, but for the most part, they're the same. And we can understand largely what's going on in higher dimensional space by studying the two-dimensional case. Okay, I'm going to have to kill this app. Because it is, it has, it has, it has died and it doesn't want to cooperate. Okay, so. Um, or actually, no, let's not do this. We'll do kill all. Uh, Zernal PP. All right, it's dead. I killed it. Just control all delete and Linux kids <laughs> kill all uh, which is even more violent okay so I want Zernal PP and we're gonna annotate um, this PDF okay all right uh, that's good all right so that's 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 basically the spiel so that that discussion was about, uh, hold on, where were we? Okay. Uh, long story, oh, oh, actually there's still some stuff that we need to talk about um, in a, oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. There's still some stuff that we kinda need to discuss when talking about these things, the notion of limit. Yeah, we need to talk about the notion of limit because we're going to talk about calculus and calculus doesn't exist without limits. Okay, so when we're looking at the functions in 1, 2, and 3, you may be thinking that these functions look continuous or maybe even smooth. Uh, where continuous, you're thinking that there's no breaks in the surface. Uh, there's no holes, there's no breaks. Um, it doesn't like suddenly jump anywhere. And smooth, you can imagine you run your hand along this surface and you're never going to encounter a sharp edge or a break. And it's reasonable to think that. It's reasonable to think that these things are continuous and smooth. But in order to have a notion of continuous, let alone smooth, continuous is like, okay, there's no breaks. Con uh, there's no breaks or holes. And smooth means it's differentiable. In order to have those notions, we need to know what limits are in multivariate space. All right, so we need to have what what limits mean in multivariate space and the thing about limits in okay let's consider the one-dimensional case we talk about the limit of a function around a point and to have a limit of a function around a point uh, we would look at our function we would we would all right well, here's our function and uh, we talk about its limit around some point and we approach it from the, the right and we approach it from the left and ask if the if uh, the function is approaching the same number if we're approaching either from the left or from the right. And this was fine when we were working in one dimension because there were only two directions by which we could approach a point. Uh, the moment we go from the line to the plane, we immediately lose the simplicity. Because now, whenever we're talking about approaching a point, we're talking about approaching a point in at least two-dimensional space. And we could approach it this way. 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 Along a really curvy path. Basically, there's an uncountably infinitely many paths along which we could approach a single point. There's no longer just two directions along which we, we can go. We can go in an infinitely many number of directions to the same point. Which means that limits are going to be a bit more... We, we need to come up with a more generalized notion of a limit. Or a, a way to think about limits. So a way that's going to work that doesn't care about the path that we take. Uh, one way we could do this is say um, the limit of a function f at a point is the unique number 
L such that for every epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero such that if the distance between the points x, y and some other point s, t is less than delta, and we're talking about the limit f at x, y, so this is the thing that's fixed. So um, it, it's the number such that if we're uh, approaching, uh, it, that if we take any other point s, t that is within some distance of x, y that we've chosen, um, that is appropriate for our epsilon, then the function at that point s t um, is within distance epsilon of the value l. And this is essentially it's the same if we were to move into d dimensions instead. Okay, so basically we're saying that if we're looking at the value of this function at points very near to the point at which we're taking our limit, then uh, the function gets arbitrarily close to the to to the limiting value right and this is the more general notion of limit by the way i have i've been intentionally vague about the notion of distance because in fact there isn't a single notion of distance you're allowed to think of distance as being euclidean distance as you learned in your geometry class uh, but we are not necessarily restricted to just euclidean distance but whatever notion of distance, distance we have this is how we're going to think of a limit and this is fine. Or another way we can think of limit is the limit of a function f at a point x, y. This is a this is probably thinking about limits in this uh, approaching a point notion. So the limit of a function f at at a point x, y is the unique number l such that whenever we have a path where the where um, that path at zero is going to be x and y because this path. Like I've been drawing it like this, but in, in principle, we could have paths that are extending in both directions. Uh, so we're just going to say that at zero, when t equals zero, the path is the point. Uh, we're going to say that both x, that the path in the x direction and the y direction, these are both continuous. So the path can't jump. We're not allowed to have jumping paths. Uh, but if we have such a path, um, then whenever we have such a path that is continuous and uh, is going to and at t, and at t zero is the point x y uh, the limit of the of the vat of that function gt so the limit of the function along that path needs to be l for any such path there are functions for which the limits do not exist and for which each linear path to a common point has a path dependent limit. Here is one such function. I'm not going to discuss it any further, but play around with that thing um, if you're curious. So basically, there are functions that don't have uh, limits. Um, but I'm not going to really talk about that because every function that I'm going to talk about uh, is going to have a limit. So for instance, uh, the function fxy at x plus y. I'm going to ask, is this function continuous at 0, 0? That means that the limit of the function at 0, 0 is the same as the value of the function at 0, 0. f at 0, 0 is going to be, well, 0 plus 0, which is equal to 0. So we need to show that uh, limits... Uh, so if we, look at the, uh, if we look at the limit of this function as it approaches 0, 0, 0, it should be also 0, 0. Maybe what we could do um, is just check, well, let's uh, check linear paths, what are happening with linear paths. So we need a linear path that's going to 0, 0. So we'll say x of t is equal to a t and y of t is equal to b t. These are linear paths that pass through 0, 0. So if this is the case, then g of t is equal to uh, f of x of t and y of t, which is equal to uh, a t plus b t, which is uh, a plus b uh, t. And as a plus b t, as we take t to zero, so the limit as t approaches zero of uh, a plus b t, that is going to equal zero which is equal to the function at zero. Okay, so that means that this function uh, has, 
has appropriate limits along linear paths, but we need to check for general paths. All right, so what do we have for general paths? Well, we, what we could say is for a general path, uh, g of t is equal to x of t plus y of t, and both x and y are continuous, and at t equals zero, they're going to equal zero. So that means that the limit as t approaches zero of x of t plus y of t, because these, these uh, functions are linear functions, that's going to be the limit. Well, no, not linear, because they're continuous functions and their value at t equals zero is zero. Uh, that means this is going to be the limit of x of t plus the limit of y of t, which is equal to 0 plus 0, which is equal to 0. So it seems like this function is, in fact, uh, continuous at 0. And by the way, it is not sufficient to check just for linear paths, because you could have functions that are not continuous um, at a point, but... Um, but for which the linear paths are all approaching the same thing. And here's an example of such a function. All right. Uh, so that's it for the basics of, um, for the basics of thinking about functions in multidimensional space. So next up, I want to talk about differentiation in multi multidimensions. So, we think of differentiation as coming up with a function in one when we're working in the one dimensional case as coming up with a function that gives you a sense of rate of change right and how quickly uh the function along which we're moving is increasing or decreasing the only thing though is that when we move from one dimension to two dimensions and then from two dimensions to to onward the question we need to ask is what direction along which are we moving because this issue that we have that i brought up before that there are infinitely many paths to a single point that's going to be an issue again when we're talking about differentiation and you can imagine this as all right we are um traveling up a hill here is our hill um what is the rate of change of the hill well that depends on the path on along which you're walking if you're walking like straight up the hill in the most direct path you could take um, that's going to be, the hill's going to look very steep. On the other hand, if you were to take a more winding path up the hill, up to a point, that path, the, the, the rate at which the hill's um, incline changes is going to be actually rather modest. And this is in fact what people, do, what uh, um, trail builders do. A trail builder will do things like switchbacks and such to decrease the rate at which the incline of of the hill uh, is uh, changing. Because if you go straight up the hill in the most direct path possible, uh, the hill will be basically its steepest. And then you're going to get exhausted because you're going to be working very hard. So the question we need to ask is, what are we going to do about the paths? Like Because the rate of change of the hill doesn't actually make much sense until we talk about the path. So what we could do is study derivatives of paths along the surface. So take our function g of t before. This function g of t, which is f of x of t and y of t, is basically tracking the height of our surface as we move along a certain path. And perhaps this instead is differentiable. And, uh, well, yeah, this we, we could instead look basically at the rate of change of the surface along a path. Um, so this is something that we could do. Uh, let's, for example, consider functions that we've seen before. Um, uh, let what then, if we're looking at these functions, what first off is going to be the the pathwise derivative of these functions in general? If we have, we're going to have to say, of course, that x and y are differentiable. So we're going to have to assume that these are differentiable functions, but okay, that's fine. All right. So what are going, what is going to be the path derivative of these functions? Uh, and then we're going to also consider for specific paths. 
So like um, x of t equals t and y of t equals t squared, that's going to correspond to a quadratic path. Uh, x of t equals t and y of t equals t, so that's going to correspond to a path uh, that's moving along, along the line x equals y. Or when x of t equals a, which is a fixed number, and y of t equals t, that corresponds to uh, a path where you've fixed the x-coordinate and you're just going to move along a path parallel to the y-axis. All right, um, I'm going to uh, first off compute some of these. Uh, we're going to say that g1 of t is going to be f t uh, t squared. Uh, g2 of t is uh, f of t t and g3 of t is f a t. All right. And uh, the derivative of uh, t is going to be uh, 1. The derivative of t squared is going to be 2t. And the derivative of a is 0. All right, so we have those basics. All right, let's start in the case. Uh, well, let's start with the linear case, fxy. Uh, is equal to x plus y. Okay, we're probably going to want to zoom in for this. Get some more space. All right, if this is going to be um, our function, then a path, g of t, will be x of t plus y of t, in which case, in general, uh, the, the, the derivative of the path uh, or the pathwise derivative of this function will be x prime of t plus y prime of t. Okay, so if we look at g1 of t and look at its derivative, that's going to be, uh, so this was the path where, where x of t is t and y of t is t squared. So this is going to be, um, uh, x prime of t is going to be the derivative of t, which is just 1. And y prime of t is going to be the derivative of t squared, which is 2t. So this will be our first uh, pathwise derivative. Our second path pathwise derivative uh, is going to be... Uh, this is when we're moving in the direction tt. And this is going to be 1 plus 1, which is 2. And if we're moving... In the third case, uh, this is where we fix x and then move along y, uh, or, or move in the y direction, and this is going to be um, 0 for x prime of t, since x of t is a constant, just a, and then uh, 1 for y, of, y prime of t, since uh, that's, what, that's what we're moving, since uh, y of t is going to be t. All right, so that's the first case. The second case where f of x, y is x times y. All right, so in this case, g of t is x of t, uh, y of t. And so that means that g prime of t, we need to use the product rule. And we're going to say that this is going to be x prime of t, y of t, uh, plus y prime of t, x of t. Okay, all right then. Um, right, so in our, in our first case, g1 prime of t, this is where x of t is going to be t and y of t is going to be t squared. So the derivative of x of t is going to be one and y of t will be t squared, so we get t squared. Uh, plus 2t uh, times, so the derivative of y of t will be 2t, and x of t is t, so we get 2t squared. So this is going to be 3t squared. Uh, uh, that doesn't seem quite right. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That, that doesn't make any sense. Hold on, hold on. That is wrong. That is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Okay, the derivative of x 
is going to be 1. And y of t is t squared. So we get... Um, yeah, so we get t squared. All right, and then plus y prime of t, which is going to be 2t, times x of t, which is t. So we get t squared, which is 3t squared. Isn't that what I just came up with? I don't know. I don't know. But it's it's right, whatever it is. Um, okay, so that's uh, g1 prime of t. Let's get g2 prime of t. So this is the case where we're moving along t uh, the, the line x equals y, in which case uh, we're going to have just t plus t in both cases. So we're going to get 2t for g prime of 2. And then we've, when we have g3 prime of t, that's going to be, well, x is fixed. So that means that the first part is going to be 0. So that leaves us with uh, a times, no, yeah, y, yeah, y is y is a t, so that means that y prime is one. So we'll just get a. All right, final case. So the final case is when f x y is equal to uh, x squared plus y squared. So if in this case our path. Uh, let's just write g prime of t. This is going to be uh, 2x of t, x prime of t, plus uh, 2y of t, y prime of t. All right, so then we get g1 prime of t. All right, what is g1 prime of t? So x of t is t. So that means that x prime of t is 1. So we're going to get 2t. And then we add the case. So y of t is t squared. So that means that y prime of t is 2t. So we'll get 2t plus 4t cubed. All right. Uh, next up, g2 prime of t. We're going to have... Uh, x of t is t and y of t is t. So this is going to be, uh, so we've got 2x of t, x prime of t. So this is going to be just 2t plus 2t, which is 4t. And then in the, the third case, this is where we're fixing a. And uh, that means that the x part, we don't have to worry about it because the derivative of a will be zero. So we'll end up with multiplying with zero. So for the second part, we get two times y of t, which is t, and y prime of t is one. So this is going to be two t. All right, so there we go. That's uh, going to be all three pathwise derivatives. All right. So that's like pathwise derivatives in general, but there are paths that are of particular interest, and those paths are the paths that run horizontally or vertically along the Cartesian plane. So in other words, we care specifically about paths that look like this or look like this. We care specifically about those paths. Um, these paths correspond to either a fixed x or a fixed y, and the unfixed variable is allowed to vary. So uh, we are considering um, functions of this form. Gxt is fxt and gyt is fty. And we're going to take derivatives of these functions and obtain g prime of x and g prime of y. And the results are what are known as partial derivatives. So a partial derivative of a multivariate function f uh, with respect to some of the with some variable x is a derivative of the function when the variable x is allowed to vary and all the other variables are are treated as fixed values and we're denoting this by partial f over partial x um, but in the uh, two-dimensional case partial f over partial x is g prime y of x and partial f or and partial uh, with respect to y is g prime x of y so this is for the 2d case in general, though, we can consider 
uh, partial f over partial x, f, f, xi, in which case I say, all right, imagine this function uh, f, like everything else is fixed except for the xi variable, which will, which will replace with t. Take the derivative with respect to t, the univariate derivative where everything else is treated um, as constant, but then replace t with xi in the end so that you end up with the proper der uh, derivative. This may be somewhat a crude way to approach it but I don't want to I don't want to do the way a proper calculus 3 class would do it because this is not a proper calculus 3 class this is just trying to get through um, and uh, explain some ideas furthermore partial derivatives I'm not planning on using these um, all that much but I do want to introduce them in this class uh, well in, in these uh, in these notes but I'm not planning on using them all that much in my class so Let's consider partial derivatives of fxy um, is equal to x plus y, x times y, x squared plus y squared. Let's consider the three-dimensional uh, three case and also the d-dimensional case, uh, just to try and get familiar with partial derivatives. So let's say case um, fxy uh, is equal to x plus y. This will be our first case. Oops. This is our first case, in which case partial f over partial x is equal to the derivative. Well, I'm actually going to write this a little bit differently. I'm going to say take this the partial derivative of the expression x plus y uh, with respect to x. So in this case, I'm not even going to really need this if, I, if this is the notation I'm going to use. All right, what am I going to get? Well, y is, is this part right here, y is effectively constant. So we can treat it as a constant, and when we take the partial derivative, it's going to go to zero. So that means that when we take the partial derivative of this, this part right here, the part that depends on y, is going to go to zero because y doesn't care about x, and x doesn't care about y. So this is just going to be 1 since you just end up taking the derivative with respect to x. And the partial derivative with respect to y of the same thing uh, apply the same logic. You don't care about x. x doesn't x has no dependence on y so that goes to zero so this is going to also equal one all right uh next situation uh the partial derivative of x times y all right in this case y is being treated as a constant and you have x times a constant which is going to be the constant and the partial derivative with respect to y of the same thing is going to be uh, x because now x is the constant so you take it's a constant times y you're taking the derivative with respect to y so you're going to get x all right uh, let's now take a partial derivative of x squared plus y squared okay um, well in this situation the y part y squared doesn't care about x so this is going to go to zero all right, in which case we're just going to have the partial derivative of x squared, which is going to be 2x. Okay, and the partial derivative with respect to y of the same thing is going to be 2y. Because, well, basically for the exact same reason. Um, all right, I, I'm, I'm getting a little irritated with how symmetric everything is. So let's, let's take the partial derivative of x to the power of y. All right. In this case, we have effective. We're going to assume that uh, y is greater than zero, just to make things simple. Okay. Um, in this situation, um, y is a power, so we can use the power rule and say that this is going to be y x to the power of y minus one. And then when we take the derivative with respect to y, and we're going to assume that y is greater than 0 um, of uh, x to the power of y, in this situation, um, now we have something of the form a to the power x or something like that. So we're going to get for our partial derivative um, x to the power of y ln of x. Because you can write... Uh, this internal part as e to the y ln of x. 
and that's how you differentiate such things. All right, so we should also probably assume, we should assume that both of these things are greater than zero. So we're also gonna say that X is greater than zero too. So in order for that to work out. Okay, let's uh, keep going. Now I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to X of uh, X plus Y plus Z. And nothing's really different. This doesn't depend on X. So both of those things are going to zero and you're gonna get one. And this is also going to be the same reasoning for the partial derivative with respect to y and the same reasoning for the partial derivative with respect to z. Because you can do the partial derivative with respect to z too, it's just we're not gonna have, it's just different variables are gonna to go to zero when we're working with those other partial derivatives. So x plus y plus z. All right. And uh, last situation, I want to take the partial derivative with respect to the price of stock I of the portfolio's value, which is, what is that? Oh, crying baby outside. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to XI of this expression. So I could write this, oh wait, um, let's uh, write instead of having i's here, let's instead have w, j, x, j. So from j equals one to d. So uh, I'm gonna say this is gonna be the partial derivative with respect to x, i. Of, I'm gonna say we have the sum where we have everything from one to D, but we're going to explicitly exclude from this sum the case where J is equal to I. So you have WJ, XJ. We're gonna take that part out as its own separate part. In which case that sum with respect to XI, it doesn't depend on XI at all. So this is gonna to go to zero when we take the derivative. And this XI is being multiplied by a constant WI so as a result, we get, in the end, wi for our partial derivative. All right. And there's a lot more that can be said about partial derivatives. There's lots more that can be said. For one thing, I haven't really properly defined them. Um, I'm just basically saying a partial derivative is like you treat all the other variables as constant and then take a derivative. So I haven't really par uh, properly defined them. Um, we haven't really tried to expand the notion of tangent line. When we're working in multiple dimensions, we would talk about tangent plane. If we were working in three-dimensional space or some tangent hyper, so, you know, hyperplane or whatever uh, for general space. Uh, so we haven't tried to expand the notion of tangency of the tangent line. Um, we, haven't, uh, we haven't talked about gradients. Gradients are extremely valuable. Uh, I am not sure how much gradients show up in probability. I'm sure they do because they're just generally useful. I definitely know they show up in statistics because statistics is going to be concerned with optimizing stuff. Uh, that's how estimators are constructed. They're optimizations. And when talking about optimization, you do talk about the gradient of a function and also the Hessian matrix. We haven't talked about higher order derivatives um, right now. So if you want, I do recommend learning about this stuff. So take a popular calculus three class, but for our purposes right now, um, for the purpose of getting through my Math 3070 class, I'm not going to say any more. In fact, I'm not even really sure that any of this discussion was really all that necessary. So I'm just going to move on to uh, integration, which really is the reason why I'm recording this stuff. This is the reason why. I wanna talk about integration in higher dimensions. Okay, so uh, when talking about integration in higher dimensions, uh, let's let's talk first about the 2D case. Well, actually, let's, let's just go back first to the 1D case. Um, the reason why we're talking about this is because maybe you remember when we were talking about probability density functions that we were thinking of there being some probability density curve and probabilities were areas underneath the curve that were obtained via integration of a one-dimensional function. Um, or a function that had only one uh, variable, effectively. The parameters don't really count as variables. Okay, 
So, um, so that's what we were doing. But when we're going to talk about continuous random variables that are jointly distributed, we need to talk about, um, well, we're going to want to expand our notion of probability density function and ex extend our notion of density. And in such a case, we're instead going to be talking about a surface over a, pl over a plane. And probably then will be volumes beneath this surface. So we're going to end up talking about volumes instead. And in order to do that, we're going to have to talk about um, integration in multiple dimensions. And we can, in fact, go beyond two dimensions to more dimensions, in which case we're going to have to think about a higher notion of volume. But, but, but fine. So, um, and also, there's an additional complication when working in when moving from one dimension to two dimensions, which is that when we were working in one dimension, uh, random variables could only be basically bound by a region that is between two numbers. So regions of of the form two less than or equal to x, uh, less than or equal to like say three. Uh, this was the only thing that was possible. Like maybe, maybe we would say, all right, we've actually got like a union of these things. But in, in the end, what we're working with fundamentally are intervals. And we would just, okay, so we got multiple intervals. We're just going to add up uh, multiple integrals, each one for one of those intervals. Um, so the, the possibilities for the set over which this random variable could exist were pretty limited and essentially amounted to intervals at the end of the day. But when we're the moment we move from one dimension to two dimensions, now we are allowed to ask whether, now we're talking about random variables as being a coordinate pair, and a coordinate pair can fall into a region. And that region doesn't have to look like an interval. It could be square, like that's fine. Um, like you could ask, what's the probability that this point ends up in this square? And that's probably the closest thing that we have to the interval that we had in the one dimensional case. But we can talk about being in a circle. What's the probability that this random variable ends up in this circle? Or this trapezoid? Like what about the random variable being, like the pair of the random variables being in the trapezoid? Or really any shape. Any shape is allowed. So that means that when we're trying to compute probabilities in this more general sense, when we have multiple random variables at the same time, we need to allow for more possible relationships among those random variables that do not really amount to um, intervals. Now we're talking about general regions, and we need to ask about what is the volume underneath the surface over a region? All right, we need to, like... Like in this sketch, this, this looks somewhat like a circular region over which the two random variables could possibly be, in which case we would compute the volume beneath the surface over that region. Right? And, 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 and not only that, we're going to have to allow for really weird regions, like this region here that I've circled in green. That's going to have to also be accounted for in some way. I don't know necessarily that we will ever... Uh, try to compute a probability in that region, but at least whatever conceptual framework we are using needs to allow for that possibility. So, um, yeah, we need to allow for computing volumes in strange regions like these. And for that, we need to rethink about how we're going to uh, work with integrals in a higher dimensional space. So, how exactly are we going to do that? Let's revisit the case when there was only one variable and we were trying to construct an interval, an integral. What we would do is uh, we would look at the interval over which we were trying to integrate our function. Remember what we're trying to do is compute the area underneath this function in a sense. That is how we're defining our integral. And what we would do is we would take this interval and we would partition it up into generally equal length segments. We would, we would partition it, and then after we partition the interval, we would then 
draw rectangles that are extending to the function. And when we would draw these rectangles, we would then have to ask, okay, when we say extend to the function, what exactly does it mean? Are we using like the left hand rule or the right hand rule? But in the end, it didn't really matter so long as the function was ultimately integrable because we would make this partition more and more fine. And as we increase the um, resolution of the partition, uh, whatever rule that we ultimately used would not matter or should not matter if the function was integrable. Right, in which case you'd have a limit, and you what you would be limiting what the the limit would be the limit of the re, of the area of these rectangles um, that we add up. Right, so we would add up the areas of these rectangles, take the limit as we make the rectangles very narrow. So the rectangles themselves individually are getting small, but ultimately are computing um, an area, and we would look at the limit of the resulting of the resulting area of the resulting sum. And that was the way we constructed what are known as Riemann integrals. And admittedly, um, these these uh, rectangles could be signed because we could have a we could have instead um, like a function that looks like this, in which case some rectangles would extend below the x-axis, so we would have to multiply the area there by negative one. So we would be working with signed areas, but at the end of the day, uh, we were working with areas. All right, that's fine. Uh, and that was how you constructed Riemann integrals. For what it's worth, uh, this approach to constructing integrals is not the only approach that can be taken. And there are there are a class of if you use a different approach, you end up with a different type of integral. Uh, one of which is the Lebesgue integral, which is not only does it include the res all of the results from Riemann integrals, it nicely expands them and in fact Lebesgue integrals are the integrals that you learn about if you were to take about if you were to take a more advanced probability class a graduate level probability course uh, but I'm not really going to mention any any more about that Riemann integrals are fine for now so what are we going to do for multivariate integrals we're going to have to do something similar instead of uh, partitioning a segment, because the one thing that was really nice about this is we were always working with intervals. So partitioning an interval is pretty easy. Um, you, you're just dividing it up into equal length segments. But now we don't have equal length segments over which we're working anymore. Uh, we, we're not working it with a segment of the line. The region over which we are integrating could be very strange. For instance, we could have the region over which we are integrating. This is looking down on the uh, Cartesian plane. It could be some shape, maybe a shape that looks like this. And we want to find the volume beneath the surface, a possibly signed volume, by the way, the volume beneath the surface over this region. Maybe I will simultaneously uh, sketch over here. Um, here's this um, weird looking region I guess it's green now I don't want it to be green uh, we have this um, this uh, region we have a surface um, hovering over the region uh, so maybe our surface looks like this and we want to find the volume um, uh, beneath uh, underneath the surface over this region so what would we do well first off our partitioning is going to be uh, more complicated since uh, we can't just divide up a, like a nice um, a nice interval like we did before but what we could do instead is maybe try to fill up to we, we can try to grid instead this shape and with, when gridding the shape there are a few decisions we can make like for example we could say uh, we could say our grid must stay within the si within the shape or we might say no 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 the ship the grid is allowed to uh, leave the shape a little bit um, and uh, in the end, whatever, however we grid the shape should not matter too much. But then with this grid, we're going to do the best we can to fill up the shape. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe extending outside of it. Here, I'm just deciding that I'm going to keep my grid inside of it. Um, but, but whatever we do, it should be okay. So we do need actually a notion of an integral region too. Like, we need to talk about whether the shape itself is a region over which we can integrate. Um, 
which um, I, I feel like, yeah, um, there's probably shapes that you could construct that are not integrable, but I think that what's necessary is just when you integrate the shape itself, it probably needs to be able to work. Okay, so we divide up our shape and come up with some grid like this, and you can imagine that in the limit, what we're going to do is make this grid more and more fine, and as we increase the resolution of our grid, uh, we capture more and more of the resulting shape, or of, of the containing shape, that is. Right, so we have, like, there is some space of this shape that is not being accounted for at all, but we should have, if this shape is a region over which we could potentially integrate, as we increase the, the uh, or as we make our squares that we're using to grid up this space smaller and smaller, uh, they should eventually contain the entire shape. Okay, and then for each of these squares, what we would then do, so this is kind of the what, what the shape might look like at somewhat of an angle. What we do for each of those squares is we draw a, or create and place a rectangular prism that goes from the square and has the square as its base and then extends up to the function or extends up to the surface above. So you end up with a number of rectangular prisms and you can compute the volume of each of those of those rectangular prisms. Right. We can, and with a simple rule, the, the, the area of the base times the height of the prism. And the height of the prism is supposed to be um, is supposed to be basically the value of the function. Now, again, we can decide how exactly are we going to determine the height of the prism, but as we, but as we make the resolution of our grid more fine, we shouldn't care too much about whatever rule we used to determine the height of the prism, right? So um, if, this, if the resulting surface is integrable, and as we increase the resolution and basically take our limit of our volume because we will add up the volumes of each of those prisms, that will be the volume beneath the surface that, it, uh, that is enclosed by the surface, um, between the surface and the Cartesian plane. And these volumes, again, could potentially be signed because perhaps the surface extends below the Cartesian plane. But in the end, this is what we would do. And we would call the resulting volume um, the integral of the, of the surface or the function f of x, y over the region dA. We're using the a to represent the region over which we are integrating. Okay, um, and this, by the way, this, this logic does in fact extend in general to um, a multi-dimensional space. It's just that we're going to have to change what exactly does it mean to be talking about um, a volume in such a space, but we could st still be doing like, um, so each one of those squares had some length, maybe you could call it delta. So in the 2D case, uh, the, the base had area delta squared. If we were to try to do, move into the 3D case, we'd have delta cubed times the value of the function or delta four times the value of the function and so on. We would do whatever is necessary to extend our notion of volume to higher dimensions. So we would have to generalize the notion of volume, talking about the volume of four dimensional stuff. Um, but we can do that. It's fine to do that, and we can still end up with what's what we understand as an integral. Okay, uh, let's have an let's see an example. Um, we're going to work with the function f of x y, which is going to be two minus the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y, and I'm going to compute the integral of this function over the area d a, which is the region such that the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is less than or equal to two. So if I were to plot this region, by the way, when working with um, when you're working with uh, uh, integrals, multivariate integrals, it's often a good idea to plot the region over which you're integrating if you can. All right. So the region over which we're integrating is going to be this diamond region. Uh, where the points of the diamond are at negative 2, uh, negative 2, 2, and 2. And we're looking at the uh, volume of the surface enclosed 
um, b between the surface and and uh, the Cartesian plane that is enclosed within this diamond. This is the, what the surface looks like. And actually, if I were to draw a sketch, the the coordinates aren't quite right. But if I were to draw a sketch, this is the the, vo the this is the shape over which we are uh, for which we are asking for a volume. It is a pyramidal shape. It's actually a square-based pyramid. Okay. We're actually asking for the volume when we're computing this integral of a square-based pyramid, and there is in fact a formula for that. So the so if we have a, a pyramid with a square base, um, I can't remember what ex exactly the name of this uh, of this uh, type of pyramid is. Uh, we have the length of the base, the width of the base, and then we have the height of the pyramid. And the volume of this pyramid will be the length times the width times the height divided by three. So in this case, the length this has this pyramid has a square base, uh, and the length of one of its sides is two root two. Okay, so in that case, um, the integral of f of x y dA, which is the integral of the function uh, two minus the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y dA is going to be the volume of the pyramid, which is, um, let's see, this is also equal to the square root of eight. So we're going to have um, the square root of eight squared, that's the length times the width times the height. So let's see, the height is going to be, um, it's going to be the value of the surface when we plug in uh, x equals y equals zero. So that's going to be two. So the height, uh, of this pyramid is going to be 2. So we're going to multiply this by 2 and then divide by 3 because that's how we compute the volume of this pyramid. So this is going to be 8 times 2 over 3 which is 16 over 3. So the, so the value of this integral is 16 over 3. Okay. All right. Um, now, this was all well and good. The unfortunate thing though is that this formula here, like I guess if I give you simple shapes, like simple geometric shapes like a like a pyramid or a sphere or something you can do this. But we're not always working with pyramids and spheres and stuff like that and we want to be able to work in general. And this formula doesn't really t or, or this expression doesn't really tell us how exactly we're going to compute the volume beneath the surface. Okay, so what should we do? Um, let's go back, going back up. Let's go back to this, to this, to this picture. What could we possibly do? Now remember that there is a volume that is associated with each of these little squares here, like because each of these squares, upon which, upon each of these squares, what we're actually doing is placing a block, um, a rectangular prism, and we're computing the vo when we're adding up all of those volumes. Well, let's think more seriously about how we add up those volumes. We're not going to just take all of these. Um, we're not going to just take um, all of these box blocks, throw them into a toy box, and then start adding up their volumes. We could actually take a more systematic approach, where actually what we're going to do is we're going to sum up um, the volume of blocks along each row, like. Compute row-wise sums of block volumes. And, and we're just going to do this going along each of those rows, which, by the way, corresponds to moving in the x direction. And let's uh, undo all of that. Okay, so... We add up all of the volumes of the blocks along the rows. And then after we add up the volumes of blocks along rows, we're going to end up with well, what, we, we, what we could imagine what we're looking at is basically um, a sum of block volumes, which would look something like this. 
And then what would we do? Well, we would then add up the, vol the, the volumes uh, that we saw for each row. So we would add up all these volumes together, and that would get us the volume enclosed beneath the surface. So what, what we're doing is we're moving in the X, is uh, we sum along the Y direction first. So we sum this way first to collapse down into, um, to collapse down into a one-dimensional problem. And then we would add up the total volumes along the X direction. And that's how we would compute the volume enclosed within this region beneath the surface. And well, actually that's kind of how integrals work already. And in fact, what we're doing, what we're doing here is we are fixing um, an X, adding and then in some way integrating for that fixed value X. Oh. So we integrate for that fixed value X and uh, um, the result will be in some sense a function. The fun and, and there will be a function uh, like something we're seeing here that is tracking how much volume there is along each slice as we move in the X direction. So how much volume there is in the Y direction as we move along the X direction. So what we can think so what that suggests is that what we could do is try is all right so take limits make our partition very fine the first thing we're going to do is sum up column blocks trans and that's going to translate to integrating in the rot in the y direction where we're fixing an x value and looking at a one-dimensional integral along a fixed value and this is computing a volume of a slice now technically we don't really have a volume because we're talking about a slice slices don't have volumes so maybe density would be better or we can instead say like there's some infinitesimal volume uh, where it's an infinitesimally small but it does have some volume if we're allowing our notion of infinites or allowing ourselves a notion of infinitesimal um, but then we're going to add these volumes up via integration again and uh, this time moving along a different direction to get the total in volume enclosed by the surface so what this ultimately is telling us, we can integrate one variable first and then the other one, right? That, that's, that's what this uh, language is translating into. Uh, sum up one direction first and then sum up the other one. So let's suppose for a second that our region is rectangular, right? The region that I was drawing was not rectangular. By rectangular, I mean a region that looks like this. Right, so uh, the borders of the region are parallel to the x and y axes. This is a rectangular region. There is a minimum and maximum value for x and y. So we have like x is between a and b and y is between c and d and there is no dependence between the x and y. Then in this case we, we've actually got, we've, we've, we've made a lot of progress by saying how, we're, how exactly we're going to compute this integral. We're going to say, all right, first, integrate with respect to one variable, which corresponds to, all right, if we're integrating by y, then what we've done is we've fixed x. So we're fixing x. We are fixing x. We have a fixed x value, and we're going to add up the volume of the blocks for particular x values. Um, so, and, and then we'll end up with a function that's tabulating how the volume of the surface uh, changes in the x direction and then we will or actually more appropriately the area of a slice uh, and then we will integrate in the x direction so so then uh, sum up the area this way okay and that's what we would do uh, if we had just a rectangular region so sum one and then the other um, and here we have a, here I integrated by y first and then I integrated x but we are in fact allowed to change the order of integration in this situation dy dx and dx dy mean effectively two different things um, dy dx means first integrate by y which means that x is treated as fixed Right, so x is treated as a fixed number, 
And then after you integrate by y, you then integrate by x. You can also do the opposite, where you first integrate x, in which case y is being treated as a fixed number, and then integrate by y. In fact, I am generally, when, when doing stuff like this, I will put parentheses around, uh, around the inner integral to make it seem as if what I'm doing is I'm treating that inter integral as if it's an integral all by itself. And the dy means that the x value is a constant for all intents and purposes when computing that inner integral. After I get that inter inner integral, I then kind of do the final integral. So you compute integrals inside out. Like, yeah, you're, you're computing them inside out. Um, this, by the way, does in fact extend to higher dimensions. If we wanted to do stuff in higher dimensions, uh, we, can, we can basically do the same trick where we integrate one variable first and then the other variable second and the other variable third and so on until eventually we have uh, until eventually we have no integrals left to compute all right so that was all just this long verbal explanation of how we compute such integrals now let's see a bunch of examples of computing these integrals so i'm going to compute the integral of f of x plus xy which is going to be the linear function we're going to do this on the region where x is bounded between 2 and 5 and y is bounded between negative 1 and 1. If I were to sketch this region, uh, so x is between 2 and 5, so this is 2 and 5, and y is between negative 1 and 1. So this corresponds to this rectangular region. This is the region over which we're computing the integral. Um, this, by the way, suggests that we actually don't really care too much about integrating x or y first and it's perfectly reasonable to think about that but you should be thinking that maybe it's more advantageous to integrate one variable or another first now in the examples that i've written down everything is extremely symmetric so there really isn't any advantage in doing one or the other first but when i talk about integrating over irregular regions um later on in this uh, in this video, we're going to want to actually think more seriously about which variable should be integrated out first. Okay, we're still streaming. All right, so, um, right. So in this case, I don't actually really care all that much about which one I integrate first. So let's say we'll integrate with respect to y first, and then we'll integrate with respect to x first. And then if we're going to integrate with respect to y first, we need to think about uh, what the bounds of our integral should be. Well, okay, y is between negative 1 and 1, so we'll put negative 1 and 1 here for the bounds of the y integral. And since x is between 2 and 5, we'll put 2 and 5 as the bounds of the x integral. Okay, now let's actually compute the integral. I probably want to zoom in to have um, effectively gain more space. All right, so we'll have 2 to 5. And as I mentioned before, I think I treat the inter inter integral as if x is a constant, so I compute that integral first. Okay, so if I'm treating x as a constant, then the antiderivative for the inner integral is going to be um, xy plus y squared over 2. This is one situation where when you draw that line to integrate the bounds over which you're going to uh, work with this antiderivative, it's probably advantageous to uh, in order to be fully clear about which variable is being treated as constant or not, uh, say, for example, in this case, y equals negative 1. y equals negative 1 and y equals 1. So in, like, you may be used to not writing the y equals part, but when you're working in higher dimensions like this, it's probably advantageous to keep track of which thing is actually varying. All right, so what is this going to be? Um, we're going to end up now with, so 2 to 5. When we evaluate that, we're going to have x times 1 plus 1 half uh, minus x times 1, uh, minus x times negative 1, so this will be plus x, uh, minus 1 half. All right, and then we're going to integrate by dx last. Uh, the one halves cancel out, so we end up with 2 times the integral from 2 to 5 of x dx. And this is going to be, 
Oh wait, actually it's more advantageous to put the two inside of the integral. So we got two to five, two x dx. It's more advantageous to do that because the antiderivative of this is going to be x squared. Then we evaluate from two to five. This will be 25 minus four, which is 21. So this integral is 21. Okay, next up. Uh, compute the volume of the region enclosed by the surface fxy, which is equal to x times y, when x ranges between 0 and 1 and y ranges between 0 and 1. Okay. So, uh, this is going to be the integral. I'm going to, let's just do, yeah, let's do x first. I can. So we got xy, uh, x ranges from 0 to 1, and y ranges from 0 to 1. And we compute the integral with respect to uh, x first. The thing though is, okay, y is a constant. So since y is a constant, I can factor it out. All right, so this will be the integral from 0 to 1, uh, y, and then we have the integral from 0 to 1, uh, x dx dy. And then uh, this right here is a constant, but this is going to be a number. This inner integral doesn't depend on y at all either. Okay, so if it doesn't depend on y either, then I could factor it out. It's just going to be a number in the end. So I'm going to get um, the integral from 0 to 1, x dx, times the integral from 0 to 1, y dy. But, but, but wait, wait a minute. The only thing that's different about these two integrals are letters. They're going to get the same number in the end. So if that's the case, this is going to be the integral from 0 to 1, x dx squared. Oh, look at that. Well, all right then. Uh, let's compute it. This is going to be uh, x squared over 2, ranging from 0 to 1, uh, squared, which is going to be 1 half squared, which is equal to 1 fourth. All right, so that integral is going to be 1 fourth. All right, uh, next example. Uh, let's compute the integral. Uh, that's where we got negative 2 to 2 and negative 1 to 0, x squared plus y squared dy dx. Okay. So this is going to be equal to um, the integral from negative 2 to 2. And we treat this all as a, as a single thing. So this will be, um, so we're integrating with respect to y. So we'll get x squared of y plus y cubed over 3. And this is ranging from y equals negative 1 to y equals 0 dx and this is going to be uh, the integral from negative 2 to 2 and we've got let's see uh, well let's see the first y is 0 so we're just going to end up with um, um, x squared um, plus 1 third that's what that's going to evaluate to okay and uh, let's keep going. So we're going to compute this integral too. Um, actually, this is an even function. This function is even, and we're computing it over a we're computing its integral over a symmetric region. So this will be two times the integral from zero to two, uh, x squared plus one third dx. Oops. Uh oh. Uh, go back. Okay, there we go, dx. Okay, and that's not too hard to do. So this is going to be, so we get uh, this is equal to 2 times uh, x cubed over 3 plus x over 3, where x ranges from 0 to 2. Yeah, that's right. And that's going to be, well, uh, we get 2... And then we've got 8 thirds plus 2 thirds, which is going to be 20 thirds. All right.
All right, so, okay, uh, last example. This one I just wanna show what you'd do if you had more than two variables. So an integral from zero to one, zero to two, negative two to five, x plus y plus z, dz, dy, dx. This might take a while. Um, okay, so this will be the integral from zero to one, uh, zero to two, and then the antiderivative on the inside, we're integrating with respect to z first. So this will be xz plus yz uh, plus um, z squared over two. Uh, z is ranging from negative two to five, and then we're gonna have dy dx. Okay. Um, and then we're going to compute this. So we'll have that this is equal to integral from zero to one, integral from zero to two. And uh, we've got, all right. So we're going to get um, x plus y times uh, seven. So we get seven times x plus y. And then plus 25 over two minus four over two, which is going to be uh, 21 over two. So we have plus 21 over two, my apologies. So plus 21 over two dy dx. Okay. And what's this going to be? Well, uh, now y is being treated as the thing that, or x is the constant now, so y is allowed to vary. So we're going to have, um, uh, oops, the integral from zero to one. Uh, and then we've got uh, a seven, so we got uh, seven uh, x plus, no, no, no. We're going to have, I think I'm getting tired. Seven x plus, uh, plus uh, 21 over two uh, y uh, plus seven uh, y squared over two. And this is ranging from uh, y equals zero to y equals two. And then we have dx on the outside. And this is going to be um, the integral from zero to one, uh, 14x plus 21. Uh, plus uh, 14 dx. So this will be, uh, so this is the integral from zero to one, uh, 14 x plus 35 dx. And that's going to be seven uh, x squared uh, plus 35 x where x is ranging from zero to one, which is going to be just uh, seven plus 35, which is 42. All right, there we go. So there's a integration when you have uh, a square region. And now we need to talk about the case when you don't have a square region. Uh, or, or I guess not square, rectangular. Yeah, that's the better term, rectangular region. Uh, we are still streaming, right? Yes, we are. Okay, non-rectangular regions. When computing uh, integrals in rectangular regions, integration does not seem all that any harder than integration in one dimension, honestly. Uh, but when you're working with non-rectangular regions, uh, like all, all of my motivation up to this point, when, when I actually explained the theory behind uh, how you do this integration, I never actually required that the region that we integrated be rectangular. And in fact, I mentioned specifically that one of the big differences between this uh, 
between the multivariate and the univariate case is that we have non-rectangular regions and we need to be able to integrate over those. Uh, so what are we going to do? Uh, we could have, for example, a region, a circular region over which we wish to integrate that would be described by, like this, where, yeah, this corresponds to the circle. Um, or we could have the region like example eight where there was a diamond shaped region. Well, how could we think about this? Well, the first thing we want to do is probably rethink how we're describing this region. So the circular region, for example, would be a region where x ranges between negative r and r, and y which ranges between negative square root of r squared minus x squared and the positive square root of r squared minus x squared. Okay? So you would instead view the regions like so in terms of one variable, but notice that the bounds of y depend on x. So the way you would account for these non-rectangular regions is to allow basically the boundaries of the region for one of the variables to depend on the other variable. And similarly, when we're working with that diamond region that we had for the, for the, uh, for the uh, pyramid, we're gonna say that y is between negative two and two, and x is between the absolute value of y minus two and, the absolute va and two minus the absolute value of y. That is another way to translate that diamond region into boundaries where the boundaries of x depend on y, but critically, the boundaries of y are not, don't depend on anything, they depend only on numbers. So when you view a region this way, this can be very helpful because this can give you expressions that we can use to compute integrals. So another way we can, com so another way we can compute integrals when computing integrals over, um, uh, non uh, non rectangular regions is uh, we have the inner integral its boundaries will depend on the inner on the variable that we're not integrating so for 11 right here we start by integrating y and uh, the boundaries of this inter inner integral will depend on x then when we compute the outer integral its boundaries should not depend on anything and when we compute the inner integral, the result the result will be something that depends on x, but will not use y any, anymore. So this is how we would do it. Um, similarly, um, we could instead uh, compute our integral where we do x first, in which case the boundaries of the inner integral will depend on y, and then we will integrate the y out in the outer integral. And notice that we will not necessarily end up with the same function uh, as our boundaries. Um, so in this case, switching around x and y, uh, which one we integrate first, it should still end up in the same number. But that doesn't mean that the integral looks the same. It doesn't mean that you compute it in the same way. So you have to actually be rather sensitive to which variable it's more advantageous to integrate with respect to. And by the way, this does also extend to uh, D dimensions where, um, or D dimensional objects, you, you can have a formula like this. So basically the innermost integral, it's allowed, its boundaries are allowed to depend on the other variables, but you're reducing the variables on which you're depending as you uh, compute further and further out integrals. Okay. Um, um, it does. It still doesn't matter which variable against which you integrate first, but it may be more adva advantageous to integrate with respect to one variable before you integrate with respect to the other one. Um, another thing you can do. Let's suppose that you can. Uh, write your area, your region, as the union of two disjoint regions, then you could compute an integral over the region by computing the integrals over those two separate regions. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to visually uh, compute the integral over the region A, you could instead compute the integral over the region A1 and the integral over the region a2 and sum the, the the and sum those two integrals to get the integral over the entire region a and it might be necessary if you didn't pick your uh, region well to have to do something like this where you break up the region itself
but hopefully you write your your you, you choose your integral in such a way that you don't have to do something like this oh my gosh i am getting so tired <laughs> um i don't know how long this this uh, video has been running uh it's probably been a couple hours and we're still not done like 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 the hard part is ahead of us so i don't know how i'm going to make it but i'm going to try my best because i don't want to have to take a break um okay um what am i thinking about now oh right 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 let's suppose that our region over which we're integrating looks like this okay when you're integrating something like this actually let's 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 do something different let's suppose instead that our our region looks like this okay which is it more advantageous to integrate by fixing y first or fixing x first when i say fix the way you should read fixing y first is you read that as saying i'm going to draw a line that's parallel to the x-axis that corresponds to a fixed y and then when i compute that integral this is going to tell us how we're going to compute the inner integral it tells us that the inner integral is going to pass through whatever we have for our lower bound of x first and then pass through the upper bound so we might have for example um uh, maybe there is a function that describes the boundaries of this region uh maybe uh u of no that's not you maybe u of y and uh l of y okay uh, this would tell us that our inner integral needs to pass through so it, it would tell us that when constructing our integral we will have an integral of the form l of y to u of y uh we got f of x y y is being treated as fixed so we're integrating by x in the inner integral the outer integral we need to then ask all right if y is being treated as fixed what are the what is the range of y well the range of y is going to be uh, is going to be the part that's enclosed in red so we might have um a here and b here so then we're going to integrate y from a to b so i'm drawing these uh line to try to get a sense of what exactly i'm integrating um, and how i'm going to construct my integral okay um if i were to instead attempt for this shape let's just erase all of this and then redraw it uh, if i were to attempt to integrate this shape so it looks something like this if i were to try to do it by x first i notice a few issues so i'm fixing x if i'm fixing x i've got a part where there is a lower function upper function but it's not passing uh between this uh lower node right but then I would fix it in a different part and I'd have and I'd have basically this line passing between four points rather than two. And then I have another region over which it would pass through two again. Which would mean that when computing this integral, I would probably have to do something like this, where um, I break up the shape into uh four parts a part where i'm only going to ever pass through twice um and another part where i'm only passing through tw twice but it's a disjoint part um and then a third part where i'm well okay i would compute an integral for the pink region and then another one for the green region so i'd end up having to compute four integrals so and we would have expressions for 
Um, okay, I suppose that what we could do instead is maybe um, have a blue integral. So remove this. Uh, I could instead, I guess, have um, a, a, a blue integral for this region, a red integral and a green, green integral. And that would also probably work. Um, that would probably be fine. So, um, so let's see, for this first blue part, um, I would have to be passing through, um, I would divide this up at the pink line and have um, L1 of X and U1 of X. So I would have the integral where the inner, inner part is uh, L1 of X u1 of x uh, i'm just going to write f i'm not going to write f of x y for now because i'm actually getting really tired uh d and uh x is treated as fixed so we're integrating with respect to y and this is going to range from uh let's see we've got uh a um b c no that's not use green for C because it's not easy to see uh, C and then D so for that first integral uh, that corresponds to the blue region I would inter be integrating from uh, from X X is now allowed to vary so we integrate from X from A to C and then I would have to so this is corresponding to the light blue region I would then integrate um, let's say this, we are going to have L2 of X, uh, U2 of X. So we would integrate, um, from L2 of X to U2 of X. And here we, uh, X would range instead from B to C, F, X, Y, uh, dy dx and then finally uh, we would have an integral where x is being uh, x is ranging from c to d and y is ranging from let's split this up here we'll have uh, l3 of x and then we have u3 of x so this would be um, uh, l3 of x to u3 of x and then f dy dx. Okay, so that's how you would do it if you decided that you were going to um, fix y for, no, no, fix x first, which would then mean that you integrate y first. Okay, that second approach is much more difficult, as you can tell. Like, I end up having to compute three integrals. It's all very painful. It's exhausting to even think about, and I, and I don't even have any numbers here. <laughs> so um, it would be really hard. So thinking very carefully about which directional along which you should integrate is good practice. Oh, well, I, I guess I don't need to erase all that. So yeah, I can keep all of that. That's fine. All right, so home stretch. Um, I do have these written down. So long story short, think very carefully about the region over which you're integrating. So example 13, uh, recompute the integral from example eight, but without using a formula for the volume of the pyramid. Okay, so uh, the region over which we're integrating is this region where we have um, uh, where we have basically straight lines connecting two, two, negative two, negative two. So I can come up with formulas for each of these lines. Like for example, um, in this corner, I have y is equal to x minus two. This corner, I have y equals uh, two minus x. And this corner, I have 
y equals negative x minus 2. And in this corner, I have y equals x plus 2. OK. And uh, so this is probably suggesting that what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix uh, my inner integral. But actually, I've got this issue where um, I've got this uh, this uh, point at z where um, x equals 0. So I'm actually going to want to probably break this up into two separate integrals. Uh, an integral where x ranges from negative 2 to 0 and an integral where x ranges from 0 to 2. So my integral of f over the region a is going to be um, an integral where x ranges from negative 2 to 0. Um, uh, f of x, y, d, uh, y, dx. And then we have an integral where x ranges from 0 to 2. Um, f of x, y, dy, dx. Okay. And in the first case, for the first, where x is ranging from negative 2 to 0, we're going to integrate from the lines negative x uh, minus 2 to x plus 2. And in the second integral, <coughs> Uh, we're going to range. Uh, we're going to range from x minus two to two minus x. Okay. Now I actually can take a shortcut and re and remember. Okay, I can't use that formula, but this this integral is equal to this one. These are the same integral, right? Because it's basically half of the shape. So I'm just going to compute half of the volume and then double it, and uh, that will. That will work. So I'm just going to exploit some of the symmetry <coughs> of this uh, shape. Um, and in fact, well, wait a minute. I can go even further than that. Like the 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 uh, shape in this part, like whatever volume is in this part, I'm just going to quadruple that. And uh, I'll then have the volume of the shape. Oh, that's 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 a, that's not too bad. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that instead. So what would that integral be? It would be... Well, let's see. Uh, the lower line would be, we have a lower line that corresponds to uh, y equals 0, and then it would go up to the line y equals 2 minus x. So we could say that this integral is actually equal to 4 times the integral from uh, x ranges from 0 to 2, and y ranges from 0 to uh, 2 minus x. And now I need to think about um, uh, what I want to write down for f of xy, because f of xy uh, is equal to 2 minus the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y. thing, though, is um, I'm now working in the upper right-hand quadrant. So I know that both x and y are positive numbers. And in that case, if I'm only working in the upper right-hand quadrant, I only need to write down 2 minus x minus y. And I no longer need to worry about. Um, I no longer need to worry about those absolute values, so that's going to save me some trouble. And now I get to say, all right, so two minus x minus y, integrate with respect to y first. So this will be four, and then we have the integral from zero to two, and we're going to have this is going to be, so x is constant, so we'll have two minus x. Uh, y minus y squared over 2 and y ranges from 0 to 2 minus x. Alright, so what is that going to be? I'm going to need more space. So that's going to be 4 and then we're going to have Let's see, 4 integral from 0 to 2, and then we've got, um, it'll be uh, 2 minus x squared uh, minus, oh, 2 minus x squared over 2 uh, dx, and the lower end is 0. So uh, this is actually going to end up being, um, I could rewrite this. Uh, whole thing as um, 
I could rewrite that whole thing after I evaluate it and say that this is equal to two times the integral from zero to two, two, two minus x squared dx. And actually, well, you know, two minus x squared, that's fine. Because what I can do now is say u is equal to two minus x. So du is equal to negative dx. Um, so I'm basically doing a u substitution. A will be uh, two minus um, two minus zero, which is two, and b will be equal to zero. So we have an integral running in the negative direction, or it's running the wrong way. But the negative dx will allow us to switch it into the right direction, and so we can say that this is the integral of two from zero to two uh, u squared uh, du. Um, all right, so that's going to be. Uh, in fact, I could even bring this two inside and say this is two u squared du. Oh, well, there's no advantage to doing that. Um, so this will be um, two times u cubed over three, uh, and then we're taking um, and we're taking uh, u from uh, zero to two. So this is going to be 16 over three. Oh, that's what we got before. All right, very good. Our original, our original volume was correct. Okay, uh, next one. Integrate the linear function f x y equals x plus y over the trapezoidal region with corners at negative one, negative one, negative one, two, zero, zero, and zero, three. So um, it's always a good idea to sketch out the region when it's irregular like this. So uh, we have negative one, uh, negative one, negative one, two, zero, zero, and zero, three. Okay, so this is the region. Okay, that over which we're integrating. Let's think about what these functions are. Um, we could say uh, that here we have the function y equals x and here we have the function y equals x plus three so if we thought let's uh fix uh let's uh, fix y if we were going to fix y first then we would have some issues because we'd have um it would not be as simple as we could possibly make it because we would have a region where 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 the region looks triangular well we would have two regions where the function looks triangular or where uh, okay I'm getting tired. We would have a region over which um, we have a sub region that is square and two triangular regions. And that's kind of rough. Uh, we would, I, I, we could do that. It's fine, but it's also more work than we need to, especially since if we decide to fix X instead, we only need to worry about, well, well, basically everything works out great. We just have to integrate from, y equals x to y equals x plus three so that's how we're going to so we're going to basically fix um, our x first so we fix x first which means that we're going to integrate from uh, y equals x to y equals x plus three so y is what's varying so we have x plus y dy uh, here's a little tip the variables that show up here should not be the variable that's written for the d right so those should be two different variables. And then x is going to range uh, from negative one to zero. Okay, and then, so now we've set up the integral. Basically setting up the integral for these things is the hard part. So we're gonna integrate from negative one to zero. And uh, we have xy plus y squared over two, uh, ranging from y equals x to y equals x plus three d oh dx sorry i'm i'm getting really tired <laughs> um uh so dy dx okay so what's that going to be um so this is going to equal the integral from negative one to zero 
we've got uh, x times x plus 3 um, plus uh, x plus 3 squared over 2 minus um, minus x squared uh, minus x squared over 2 dx and I have already worked this part out um, I have already worked this out this is going to be the integral from negative 1 to 0 of uh, 6x plus 9 halves dx okay and this is going to be well uh, we get 3x squared plus 9 halves x uh, where x is ranging from negative 1 to 0 and at the end the number that you get is 3 halves after you work that out okay uh, example 15 Exam uh, integrate fxy equals xy over the region enclosed by the circle x squared plus y squared equals 9 okay so what is this going to end up being uh, this is going to be so let's uh, sketch out our region this is a case where we really don't need to think too hard everything is rather symmetric so um, just for fun we will fix y first so if we're fixing y first then what are we passing through the lower endpoint of this circle will be so imagine splitting the circle at the pink line so that means that the lower half can be expressed by the function negative uh, negative square root of 9 minus y squared. Oh, that's a g. I'm really tired. So 9 minus y squared. That's the lower part. And the upper part can be the square root of 9 minus y squared. So without the negative. Okay, so we pass through the negative square root first and then out at the positive square root and uh, and if we're fixing y first y is going to range ultimately between negative 3 and 3 so that means our integral is going to be in the end uh, negative 3 to 3 and then we have negative square root of 9 minus y squared uh, to the square root of 9 minus y squared and we've got xy uh, dx dy okay and uh, that inner integral doesn't depend on uh, y at all except for the boundaries and by the way if the boundaries depend on y then the integral depends on y so maybe you remember uh, before when we saw this integral I took this integral and basically brought it outside of the entire integral we can't do that now because the boundaries depend on the outer integral. So the boundaries depending on the outside means the whole thing. It means that that inner integral does depend on the other variable. Okay, so we can't do that trick here. Um, okay, so um, when I work with this, this is going to be, oh, this is blue and I'm too tired to care. Um, I do get to say, though, that this is going to be the integral from negative 3 to 3. And we have y, and then we have the integral from negative square root of 9 minus y squared to the square root of 9 minus y squared uh, x uh, dx uh, dy. And you can probably see where this is going. Um, hopefully you can recognize that we're integrating an odd function over a symmetric region. But we're going to say, all right, this is equal to the integral from negative 3 to 3. Uh, what we've got y here and then we've got x squared over 2 uh, ranging from x equals negative root 9 minus y squared to x equals root uh, 9 minus y squared and then we got dy on the outside and this is going to be integral from negative 3 to 3 
y times uh, so oh, well okay we'll write y over 2 and then we got 9 minus y squared minus 9 plus y squared dy but that part's equal to 0 so the whole thing is equal to 0 all right so that's that basically the function xy we were integrating it over a region where it in so at some level it's an odd function so and it was being integrated over a symmetric region so we ended up with something uh really nice and we ended up with two parts we ended up with a positive part and a negative part canceling out okay uh continuing on the last example oh thank goodness merciful heaven this is exhausting <laughs> all right so the last example integrate the function fxy equals x squared plus y squared over the region such that y is between negative two and two and we have this complicated expression for the region but i can sketch it for you so here's the sketch the upper bound is basically uh, a parabola with uh, that's uh, pointing towards the y-axis and it has intercepts at negative two and two so here's two and here's negative two so these are y-intercepts by the way so and it, you can probably figure out that over here this point is four okay um that, so x is equal to four at its greatest extent um so uh y is either between that function and the other function also has intercepts at negative two and two and it also has an intercept at zero at, at which point it bounces so this is so this region looks something like this i call it a cardioid because it kind of looks like a heart so this is the region over which we're integrating and this actually resembles like when we're thinking about which uh, uh direction across we could across which we should integrate we should clearly fix y first y is clearly the one that we would fix first for one thing if we were working in this direction we would have to invert these functions and i don't even know how to do that um <laughs> i don't even really know how to invert those so that's hard and also we would end up with a very complicated looking integral so uh clearly the advantage is to fix y in which case we're going to pass through this blue function first and pass out of the and, and pass out of the red function um and the y values themselves if we're going to fix y y is ranging between uh negative two and two all right so in the end our integral will be you will only need to compute one integral and it will be the integral where y ranges from negative two to two and x ranges from uh, y squared times y minus two times y plus two that's the lower bound and the upper bound is negative y minus two times y plus two and the function we are integrating is x squared plus y squared we're integrating with respect to x first because we're fixing y and then we integrate with respect to y last okay so what is this going to be uh we could say um that this is going to be um I, i'm going to skip a lot of steps because a lot of this stuff is just tedious at the end of the day you guys should know how to integrate polynomials and then and ultimately this is integrating a polynomial so we have an integral from negative two to two and on the inside we've got um we're going to have um x cubed over three plus xy squared and this is ranging from x is equal to y squared times y minus 2 times y plus 2. And the upper bound is going to be x times uh, x equals negative y minus 2 to y plus 2. All right, uh, dy for the outside. Okay, so what does that become? Uh, that is going to be 
the integral from negative two to two, you do um, a lot of work, a lot of work. And uh, you will get, this is going to be one third. And um, actually, actually I can recognize, no, we'll, we'll just leave it like this. Um, so one third, and we've got the integral from negative two to two, 64 minus 16 y squared um, plus, oh wait, hold on, it's on the next page. Okay, uh, this should be, this should be a little bit different. All right, 64 minus eight y squared. Uh, minus y to the fourth, uh, minus 64 y to the sixth, uh, plus 16 y to the eighth, uh, minus 4 y to the tenth, plus y to the twelfth, dy. And you may recognize, oh, this is actually an even function. Since it's an even function, we can change the bounds of integration and also just multiply the whole thing by 2. And so we can say instead that this is going to be uh, 2 thirds and the integral from 0 to 2 of that crap, which is going to be uh, 2 thirds. And then we've got. Uh, 64y minus 8 thirds y cubed, uh, no, minus, uh, minus 1 fifth y to the fifth, uh, minus 64 over 7, uh, y to the seventh. Uh, plus 16 over 9, y9, uh, minus 4 over 11, y11, uh, plus 1 13th, y to the power 13. This whole thing needs to range from y equals 0 to y equals 2. And in the end, the number that you get is negative 200, uh, 2,400,000. And seventy one, no, twenty four million seven hundred and eighteen thousand sixteen divided by one hundred thirty five thousand hundred thirty five. And we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more about that. You can get that yourself, it would probably be good practice. There's a lot more that we can say about integration. I never mentioned change of variables in higher dimensions. And changing variables in higher dimensions is much more involved than it is in lower dimensions. And it is also an essential part of integration theory and probability theory. Probability theory is using change of variables. I'm not going to talk about it here because I'm not planning on using it in my class. So I'm going to conclude the discussion here. Uh, I am super tired. If you want to learn more about this, take a multivariate calculus course. You probably will have to at some point. I bet it's a prerequisite. Um, but you're just gonna have to, to work with that. All right, so that's it. That's the end of this video. And uh, I will see you later.